I'd like to share a lesson I've learned this weekend, playing and shooting some hoops with my son. Let's put this picture up. Prophetically speaking, in this month, on the 23rd, my son will officially turn six. Now, this number 23, we always thought it was ironic because his middle initial is J. One time, someone asked me, Pastor Sam, did you name your son? Is that a middle initial J for Jesus? I'm like, no. Who in their right mind would name their son after Jesus? I mean, I know there's like, hey, Zeus, I don't know what that's about. Why you would give that type of pressure to your kids? Jesus, that's, you know, really high expectations. No, J stands for Jordan. Yes, Michael Jordan. Some people say he's a bad man, but I don't care. <laughs> We're just talking about sports. And I named him Jordan because I love my passion for basketball. And since he was born, I mean, he was surrounded by the Jordan emblem, as you see in these socks. And this is my second son. And my wife sending it to me out of the blue to make me happy. And, you know, he, and I brainwashed him, I mean educated him, watching movies like Space Jam on Blu-ray, where Michael Jordan infamously can't act very well. And, you know, he always been surrounded by basketball, surrounded by that Jumpman logo. And so he figured, because he sees Jordan flying, Michael flying, when he starts to play, he's going to fly too. He goes, that's why you named me Jordan, right, Daddy? So that I, I could fly? You knew I could do it? I'm like, yeah. Well, this weekend, we went out to the court where the first time he tried to learn how to play basketball. And you should have saw his face as he sank on the floor. And he just, it's like the, his wind got knocked out of him. And he's like, man, flying is not so easy. He, he was sank by gravity, something called gravity. And you should have saw him. He was so disappointed. And me and Andy and, and his brother had to say, don't worry, you're only five. He's like, I'm never going to learn how to play basketball. I'm never going to fly. I can't even make a basket. I mean, he should know that a lot of people in our church can't make baskets. <laughs> Maybe it'll make him feel better. But the truth is, what do you do in life when everything you expected your life to be doesn't happen? Life doesn't plan out like you always imagine. What do you feel when your spirit is crushed? Because you, know, you don't have to be five to understand that spirit. You know, I think personally that a crushed spirit a broken heart is so much more painful than any physical pain. I remember when my wife broke up with me in college. I was like, I'm so hot. How could you break up with me? This is not possible. But when she broke up with me, let me just tell you honestly, at that, at that moment, it's like someone, it's like life betrayed me and punched me in the gut and said, you're going to stay down forever. i rather of, you know, pounded my head on cement than to feel that pain. But the truth is, all of us in our life had expectations of what our life would look like. And then you come to a certain place and you look at your life and it looks nothing like what you imagined. And you go, I never thought my life would end up like this. And then you feel this sense of utter disappointment. What do you do? When that happens in life. Of course, that happens to everyone. Those stupid NBC commercials that said, hey, put your mind to it. You can do anything. And you're like, oh, yeah, I believe that. And then you realize it's not so easy to fly. Well, that's where this woman was, wasn't she? While she was walking, the text says, at noon to draw water. And remember, this is Samaria. This is the Middle East. This is the desert. No one draws water at 12 o'clock because it's not a very good time to draw water because it will evaporate. You see in her isolation, she's walking 
And you know about the five husbands that Jesus brings up. You know about the man she's living with. That's not her husband. Now she, in the altar of love and romance, thought that only if she could get married and find the right man and the right person and the right life. And she dreamed a dream that her life would be a certain way. And she's walking alone to what? Obviously to escape from the, the other women in the town because they did not look at her favorably, favorably because, you know, because of her lifestyle. There's immense judgment and she's walking along and we can relate to that resignation and we can all relate to that disappointment as she walked. I thought my life would be different. And there, at verse 4 of this passage, in her disappointment, in her, where her spirit is crushed, you see verse 4 where Jesus says in John that Jesus had to go to Samaria. And we said this last week that Jesus didn't have to geographically go through Samaria because of racism. At the time of captivity of Israel, Samaria fell under and became a mixed race, so the Jews felt very antagonistic toward them saying that they didn't really, they betrayed God. So usually Jewish people would escape Samaria by going through the Jordan River, which is out of the way. But when the text says Jesus had to go to Samaria, Jesus wasn't going to Samaria for any other reason except to meet this woman. And how those two things, those ideas converge, her disappointment and God's appointment and Jesus being there for her. How does this meet? Well, I believe that in our disappointment, God teaches us, or it, our disappointments fuels us to become true worshipers of God. Disappointments are the signpost, really, if we're going to look in this text, of what we idolize without even knowing it. There are certain values that we possess in our life that has overtaken us, but yet we do not realize it. And no wonder we're disappointed again and again. For what we're looking for, is really, that's not really it. And we'll look deeper into that and unpack that. But I want to really show us from this passage in this story how her disappointment fuels her worship of God. So let's look at this text as we go back to this passage. And we start from the middle of the conversation when Jesus says, He told her, go, call your husband. And come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said, you're right. You've had five husbands. And the man you have now is not your husband. And she says, what you have said is quite true. And pay attention to this part of the text. Because look at her transition from how Jesus read her mail now you can see how this would be uncomfortable for her because obviously she came to this well at this time at noon to escape the fact that she had, she had five husbands and the fact that she's living with whoever she's living with is not her husband. And the disappointment in that, she left and ran away in resignation of what her life became. And Jesus and God's just like, bam! You can't run away from that. He's just like calling her on it. She's like, no, I don't want to deal with that. How many people here know what I'm talking about where you just don't want to deal with that stuff? It's just too much. You're tired from dealing with it. She's like tired from it. I don't care. I just want to be alone. I just want to sulk. How many people here? Let's all sulk together. Ready? Ah, uh, do it with me. Tell someone, ah. Uh. Well, you guys are really good at that. When I go, amen, people are like, amen. Sulk, ah. Uh. A lot of practice soaking. But you see, it's very important to understand that God does not allow us to move away from the heart of the issue, even if we want to at times. Why? Because he cares for us. He cares for our story. This woman is of no significance to anyone in the universe. Not those five men that divorced her and not the man that cannot commit to her as a result of those five. She has very little value in her life. As you know, if she can go at noon to draw water, her purpose in life has been really reduced to nothing. But yet God, Jesus, cares enough to stop by and goes out of his way 
And you know, this is really the heart of the Father, the heart of who God is. He meets us where we're at. And then she transitions the topic that's taboo for her and says, and gets spiritual on him. Verse 19, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. She wanted to get theological with Jesus, which is bad. <laughs> you get theological with God. But the Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus says this, and pay attention to that. Jesus, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for the salvation is from the Jews. Yet, a time is coming, and now has come. Everybody say that word. And what? what has what? Now come. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. What is Jesus bringing up here about her life? That's very parallel to ours. You see, when the woman says, you Jews said we have to worship in Jerusalem and not in this mountain, our father Jacob, the founder, the patriarch of Judaism, Jacob changed to Israel, taught us to worship God from here. You see, what she's saying is, theologically speaking, she doesn't know what she's worshiping. And Jesus is saying, what you're worshiping is not neither in this mountain or in Jerusalem. What you're worshiping in your whole life is in the altar of romance. See, her idol and her, the desire, the greatest expression of, in her heart, the greatest desire within her heart was love. Whether she knew it or not, that was her idol. She only thought, I mean, five husbands? You know anyone that did something stupid five times? Everybody raised their hand. <laughs> Yo, all those people are stupid. Yeah. And then you just look in the mirror and you, you did something stupid five times and you did it over again. And why do you keep going to places that hurt you and hurt me? Why do I want to keep eating this donut? It's going to hurt me. Obviously, it's an idol. That's kind of pathetic, a donut is an idol. But you know what I'm saying? You keep going to this place over and over again. Why? Because the heart seeks it. For her, the expression of the deepest desire of her heart was for a man that would complete her life. It was this utopian idea of love. And she goes, okay, not this man, then that man, not this man, then that man. And every single time, her heart was broken. A lot of times, we don't know. I know that there's this obsession lately with Victor Hugo's novel of Les Mis. And I think this picture of her life is well captured in the song, I Dream the Dream. When the character sings, destitute, left by her man and pregnant, unable to pay for stuff in her desperation, she sums her life up by these two lines. And every time I hear it, I'm just like, so sad. And I'm so moved by it because I can identify, well, not with the woman part, but you know, you know what I'm saying. I identify when she says, when I was young and unafraid. When... When I used to dream that love would last forever. And I'm sure if she could look at herself where she was and looked in the past, she would say, don't be stupid. Love never lasts forever. But she says, when I'm young and unafraid, I thought love, I dreamed that love would last forever. She goes, but now, what she say? Life, but now, at this present moment, life has killed the dream I dream. Those are powerful ways to capture our idol in our life. Where she was what? Broken again. And Jesus here is saying, you don't even know what you worship. 
you're disappointed because what you worship is not bringing you satisfaction. You're worshiping the wrong thing. So the question was, how does our disappointment, how can it fuel for us to become true worshipers of God? Well, the first lesson we learned from this story of the woman is what? Read it with me. What? It what? Identifies what you've been what? Worshiping all along. This is why for a lot of people, it's hard to understand how to worship God in the church. You're, express, you're expressing these songs, and, and you know what? I'm not knocking on every, everyone. I'm just saying that a lot of times our heart is divided. I know there is a desire for God, but a lot of times as we sing these songs, there are disconnect with God because our heart is somewhere else. We do worship. Everyone worships. It's not if you worship. It's what you worship. And what you desire most, the expression of what you desire most is in, inside of our heart. So you could be idolizing a life, idolizing a person, idolizing a status, idolizing whatever, and that's what your, what your the heart, the propensity of your heart is drawn toward. Because that's what you worship. That's what you want to become. That's what you want to consume. And what does that always lead to? Heartbreak. So I want to pray that the Holy Spirit, I pray that Jesus would meet you and me at this well today in our disappointment of whatever we think is going to bring us completeness. I pray the Spirit of God will show you the faces, the places, the things that we truly worship. It's not, it's, it's not if we worship something, it's what. And it's important to identify it so we can get a sense and realize that's not what we want. And I pray the Spirit of God will show you today as we go deeper into this text and this story. Now, I know what some people are thinking. Okay, so life is just about disappointment and failure, and trying to make it, and not a lot of people make it. That's so depressing. Let me tell you the other side of the story, though. Some people do make it. Some people do marry the man they want, get the person they, they want. They get the status they want. They get the degrees they want. They get the jobs they want. They get the kids they want. They get whatever they want, such and such a thing. And then the worst, of, worst part of it is if you are disappointed in it and you are short of achieving your dreams or whatever you thought would complete you, that's a different story. But what if you get it? Right? What if you get it? And you still say, it's not what I thought it would be. How many people here in this room, you were so excited to get this thing, and you got it, and you're like, that's it? Tell someone, that's it? <laughs> you know, that, that, that's it? That's what I was worshiped? That's it? And you know what? That's the most frustrating part about life. When you're in the trenches and broken dreams, you're like, oh, only if. And then you get what you want, and you're like, that's it? Human beings are crazy. I mean, you don't know how many times I have business leaders contact me. And I mean, their, their wealth is not measurable anymore. You know, when you talk about bonuses, it's just like, okay, why don't you help our GDP problem? Why don't you help our debt ceiling? You know, people, I mean, with just immense wealth, immense success, just promotion after promotion. This is the confession of most successful people I know in my life. They go, Pastor Sam, people are congratulating me. People saying that I wish I had your life, and they don't know I'm a slave to my job. I don't even know why I'm doing this anymore. And then what he says is, and what most people say is, 
what is the point of all of this? Now what? They thought what will bring completion and the status and the wealth and the fame and the recognition and even the approval would bring like a, you know, where you would do a little dance and you wake up and you do another dance and you're happy and you're complete. But they go, I don't get it. It's not enough. So I go out there and do more. But then now I'm a slave to my job. Now I'm a slave to my lifestyle. I can't get out. And every time a lot of them open their mouth and as they come to Christ, I say, that's because you're worshiping the wrong thing, you idiot. And they go, no pastor has ever spoken to me like this. Well, I'm different. I don't really care. And they're like, oh my gosh, that's true. You see, Jesus here, let's go down, addresses this issue. That what we're ultimately really longing for, and what we've been talking about for the last few weeks, it's not materialistic. Listen to the great culture theologian Alicia Keys. When she says, I got nothing if I ain't got you. When she says, some people want everything. They want diamond rings. They want roses. They want chocolate. They want Boston. Well, that's my paraphrasing. She goes, they think the physical things. But I know that life, she says, that life is a bore. You see, I want you to stop and listen to what Jesus is saying in this text and let it resonate in your spirit. Let it resonate in your story because ultimately what we're looking for is not materialistic, it's metaphysical. It transcends the physical. And that's why whatever physical thing you try to consume still makes you thirsty, still makes you hungry, still makes you frustrated. And what John Eldridge and many authors before him called the haunting of the soul. It's still, there's a haunting within our heart that says, this is not enough. It is the spirit. Tell someone, it's the spirit. Tell them, it's the spirit within your soul. It's the spirit. What the heart is longing for is the spirit. It's not in this world. You can't worship something in this world because it's created. It only reflects, it's only a prism of the beauty of God and the personality of God. And look what he says. Yet a time is coming and now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For there are kinds of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in, in what? In spirit and what? In truth. So you need the correct theology. It's what you worship, as we addressed before. You need to worship, and you want to worship God, but it's the spiritual. It's a substantial need within the soul that cannot be satisfied by the physical. You know, Francis Collins, the director of the National Science of Institute in the United States, you know, PhD from Yale, was an atheist, an agnostic at 27, and he came to Christ because of this issue. He says, as he presents about his belief in science and faith and how they converge in his life, and he says, this is my only way I can tell people about God. If you don't know, Francis Collins, from 1993 to 2003, basically uncoded the sequence of the human DNA the Human Genome Project, where there's 3.1 billion bits of data in one cell of the human DNA. 3.1 billion. And basically, he sequenced every single one of them in 10 years. And if you look at the, if you look at the human DNA, what he usually does for why he worships God, he gives a talk about the complexity of the human DNA and how that's almost impossible to replicate by chance or probability and he puts it up in the screen with all the colors as it spins around in the double helix kind of way you know and you see all the colors and he goes folks i've tried to understand it you, you all know i'm smart i only not only have a phd i have an md so the, those doctors out there you think you know the body i know it better than you 
I tried to, com- I tried to grasp this by natural selection. I tried to grasp this by evolution and probability. I, you know, but, but there's only one response I come up with when I see the human DNA. He turns the lights off. He turns black. He puts the DNA up in, in the screen. And, he get, and he's infamous for playing his guitar at commencement speeches. He gets his guitars out. And he sings a hymn. And then he says, there's only one response to the human DNA. That's worship. God created us. Only God can do this. No matter how much I try to understand the physical and the material, it leads me to the metaphysical. Folks, Because we've been disappointed by physical things, because we've been disappointed for what we're looking for, expressing that our heart desires most, it can fuel us to become true worshipers. How? Well, second lesson we learn in this text is what? This holy discontentment is really what? A spiritual longing for the metaphysical. It's a longing for God. That fellowship with God. There's no other explanation than this. That's our home. And let me conclude, as the Holy Spirit convicts you on your holy discontentment, because I want to just let you know how many people here like to complain about things. Like Kanye likes to complain about things. He says that he's most gifted at finding what he likes the least, what he doesn't like the most. In one of his songs, how many people here know what I'm talking about? Like complaint, oh, this is not hot, this is not, this is too cold. You, you smell. You this, you that. Why, why are you do, living your life like this? You know, why, is, why are you in my case? Like there's this, this, this discontentment every day, this ambivalence we talked about last week. There's this discontentment, and let me tell you, that discontentment, that frustration is a holy discontentment. It's a longing for the holy. A longing for God. And you know what? You can go back to the very beginning of creation in the Garden of Eden when God created everything. The Bible says that God created paradise. And you know what? We tr- we're always, in some sense, in an intuitive sense, always trying to go back to that garden. And you know what? You can get the girl in it. She'll break your heart. Because she, she'll eat from that fruit and end paradise. That's what people say. When you go in a relationship, your paradise ends. I'm kidding. You know, but that's what happened in Genesis, okay? Just saying it's empirical. But you could get the girl and, you know, and she could be fly. And because the first woman is fly, her name is whoa, man. I mean, that's what, that's what happens. And, and, you know, and you can have the woman and then you can have paradise in an island and then you can have all the sustenance in the world. And that's what people are trying to go for, right? You're trying to find the garden of the Lord, right? You try to get the person. You try to get the security. You try to get the significance, the purpose needed. And then you, you get all that stuff and you go, there's something missing in this picture. And what's missing 100% of the time is the Lord. That's why it's called the garden of the Lord. It's the Lord that created the garden. It's the Lord that created the man. It's the Lord that created the woman. It's the Lord that created us for himself. We're looking for that fellowship. And until we get that fellowship, everything will be discontentment. And that's why Jesus says in verse 26, as she says, someone will come and explain to me this soon. Then Jesus declared, I am the one speaking to you, am he. I pray we'll respond to that statement today. Let's stand and pray together. Will you lift your hands with me in a moment of reflection? 
I pray for an intensity, Lord, of our holy discontentment in our life. I pray our disappointment will fuel us from the pent-up angst of desire that cannot be satisfied by the physical. No matter how much and how great a gift is, the garden of the Lord is not the garden, the perfect garden we were created in without the Lord. I pray today that we would commune with the Lord in the garden. So as you lift your hands to God, will you tell Him about your discontentment? Let's stop looking around and looking within. Let's start looking up. Let's allow the disappointment to feel our worship today. Because really, at the end of the day, all the prism of expression of desire within our hearts is a longing for Him. We belong to Him. We belong to Him. I belong to you, Lord. Today, will you, perhaps, maybe even for the first time, learn the spirit of worship? Let's worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Let's identify what we're worshiping, and now let's take it off the throne of our heart. And place God on the throne. For that's who we seek in spirit and truth. Listen to these words as we sing. Let's make it our prayer. in your mighty hand. God's written on our heart. Surrender 
belong to you. So Father, we come before you this afternoon. God, we thank you for the holy discontentment that always points to the reality that the idols of our life, the idolatry in our culture, in our life, can never satisfy the longing for the transcending metaphysical longing, the spiritual longing for the Lord. A lot of times, marketing and advertisement and the cultural values will tell us what we need is the garden, but there is no garden without the Lord. The last time I checked, the garden disappeared when the fellowship with the Lord was broken. Father, I pray in the midst of whatever we're going through in our life, in whatever disappointment we're going through, we pray we will not waste a single disappointment of holy discontentment to continue to worship in the altar of whatever physical thing that can never satisfy the heart. But it would lead us back to God. It will lead us back where we belong. In your arms, in your love, and in your grace. Will you bow your heads for the benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's people say, amen. God bless you. We'll see you very soon. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stu Still. I'm a small group leader here at 180 Church, and I just want to welcome you all to our Sunday service. This is our fourth Sunday in the season of Lent. We're halfway through it, and uh, I'm sure everybody is um, enjoying fasting everything, right? Okay, I uh, can't make that joke. But I'm sure what everybody's really enjoying, not so much the fasting, because this isn't a season just to fast, but this is a season to feast, to really feast on the presence of God and to get all those extra things out of the way so that we can feast on those things. So, you know, again, I just want to encourage everybody to keep up, you know, with their fasting and their feasting on God's presence. And uh, if you're new to this, if you've never heard of Lent before, if you don't know what fasting is all about, it's just fasting on things that get in the way of God's presence. And I want to encourage you to join with us in that so you can really feast on who God is. Uh, we have just a couple of quick announcements before we get started today. Uh, we're going to start out with um, our uh, portraits, uh, Prophetic Portraits of New Life. It's an art show that we're going to be doing on uh, Easter Sunday. It's just portraits of uh, going from old life to new life, from death to rebirth. And uh, if you have a photo or a art piece of artwork or something that you want to submit to this, we're going to be displaying it right here. You can just submit it to your small group leader. You can talk with your small group leader about it, um, about what it's all about. And uh, you can either submit it to your small group leader or to Pastor Billy. Uh, our next announcement is about uh, prayer requests and praises. You know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the spiritual that sometimes we don't see. Sometimes we just figure, oh, I'm just having a bad day. But prayer really does make a difference in our lives, especially if there's something going on in your life that you feel like, you know what, I just can't handle this on my own. And uh, God is there to answer our prayers and our uh, prayer requests and um, our prayer line at 5397 prayer. That's one of the ways where we can ask for uh, for prayers from the community because we have people who pray just for these uh, requests that everybody sends out. And God really does work in these prayer requests. He's a good God. He answers our prayers. So I want to encourage you, if you have something going on, even if you think it's something small, send us a prayer request and we'll pray for those things. And when God moves in your, your life, we can uh, you can send a, pr a praise request as well. So that way we can all celebrate in what God is doing in your life. Our next announcement is about tithes and offerings. You know, one of the things we do here as members is we keep God in the center of our life uh, and everything that we do. And one of those ways that we do that is through tithing to keep God at the center of our finances because he is, after all, all the source of everything that we do have. So if you're a member here at 180 Church, I just want to remind you to remember to tithe faithfully. You can tithe either at the info booth in the back. You can tithe online through PayPal at uh, 180church.tv, or you can give an offering through uh Chase Quick Pay at uh, offering at 180church.tv. Our next announcement is about small groups. Small groups are where we get together, where we talk a little bit more deeply about the message and where God is working in our lives. And it's not just for people who 
have been in Christ, who have accepted Christ. But this is also if you want to get to know who Christ is and you want to you know, investigate what this following Christ thing is all about, small groups are a great place to really discover what that is all about. So if you're not a member of a small group, I want to encourage you to join one. We meet in Staten Island as well as in Manhattan all throughout the week. We have different groups for different uh, stages of life. And I just want to, again, encourage you to join one. You can just talk with Andrew Park, uh, and he'll get you plugged into one. And uh, our last announcement is about sharing the gospel. We send out our uh, Sunday sermon through uh, the email every week. And at the bottom of that email, there's a link where you can um, send that along to a friend that you want to get involved in the journey in Christ. It's really simple. It's really easy. Just at the bottom of the email, click the link, plug in their email address, and uh, you can get them started along. Those are all of our announcements. And uh, anytime you want to find out more about our church, more about 180 or what's going on, you can always just go to our website at 180church.tv. like you. You are holy. You are